Tonight on Reporting Scotland, investigators say the deaths of two men killed when a tugboat capsized on the Clyde were caused by a breakdown in safety. George Taft and Ian Catterson both drowned when their vessel went down near Greenock last February. A woman tells a murder trial she was stabbed repeatedly by her husband in front of their children at their home in Skye. Also on tonight's programme, people living in homes containing potentially dangerous rack concrete demand more support from the Scottish Government. I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't cry. It was my home for 23 years and um, it's, just, it's just caused a big massive gap and heartache. Coming up in the sport, Celtic are aiming for a giant scalp in the Women's Champions League when they face Chelsea at Celtic Park. Hello, I'm Laura Miller. Welcome to Wednesday's programme. A cruel lesson of how rapidly things can go dreadfully wrong. That was how one of the investigators summed up the deaths of two men whose boat capsized in the River Clyde. George Taft and Ian Catterson were both experienced seafarers, but they died when their tugboat got into trouble while assisting a cruise ship near Greenock. The Marine Accident Investigation Branch has found 14 safety issues directly contributed to the incident. As Suzanne Allen reports. The aftermath of a tragedy. This was the 24th of February, 2023. A few hours earlier, the MV Tug Biter had been towing cruise ship the Hebridean Princess into harbour at Greenock. The cruise ship had been going faster than expected by the captain of the tug. A report out today from the Marine Accident Investigation Branch said the speed of the ship almost certainly caused an essential safety rope to break. The organisation found 14 safety issues directly contributed to the incident, including insufficient training for the marine pilot. A health and safety expert told us the deaths were avoidable. I think it's desperately sad. And if we look at um, what's happened with regard to, to tugs over possibly 20, 25 years, we have seen these multiple fatalities occurring. And I think it, it, it's, it's not the case, and this report reveals that, definitely. It's not the case that this is inevitable. These are avoidable. And if we put in the resources uh, and we set up the appropriate systems, um, then the chances of these sorts of things happening uh, should be reduced. But I think we've seen eight um, incidents now uh, across the UK um, where there have been problems with tugs. Experienced seafarers Ian Catterson and George Taft lost their lives that day. Both lived in the area. Ian Catterson was active in his local church and was described by his parish priest as larger than life and always ready to help. The men's local MSP wants lessons to be learned. The fact that the MEIB have made these 14 recommendations, uh, I would urge both Clydeport and also uh, Clyde Marine Services to fulfil uh, these recommendations. Clyde Marine Services said, We will take time to review and consider it. Our thoughts remain with the families affected. And Clyde Port told us, The health, safety and welfare of our employees and the third parties we work with is, and always will be, our number one priority. At the end of this report, there are recommendations for associations and companies that work within this type of marine environment. But health and safety experts say this tragedy was caused by a lack of training and procedures and that it was entirely preventable. Suzanne Allen, reporting Scotland, Greenock. A woman has told a murder trial she was stabbed repeatedly by her husband in front of their four young children at their home in Skye. 34-year-old Rowena MacDonald said she was absolutely terrified during the attack by her husband Finlay. He denies murdering his brother-in-law and attempting to murder his wife and another couple. Maura Kinnebra has the story. On Wednesday the 10th of August 2022, the emergency services were called to Tarskovig in the south of Skye. Finlay MacDonald is accused of attempting to murder his wife Rowena by stabbing her repeatedly with a knife at their home. She told the court their relationship was not good. It was volatile most evenings. He argued constantly. She said she was planning to leave, had been to view a home and had contacted support services. 
He'd confronted her that morning, suspecting she'd had an affair, which she denied, but he pulled out a flip knife from his pocket and repeatedly stabbed her. Her screams alerted their four young children who came to the kitchen. She said she was absolutely terrified. He wouldn't stop. Her children stayed with her as she rang for help and he drove off in the car. She said he'd found messages on her phone between herself and a work colleague. Rowena MacDonald told the court they may have been seen as flirty, but she said she wasn't looking to have a relationship. On the other side of the State Peninsula later that morning, Finlay MacDonald's charged with murdering his brother-in-law, 47-year-old John McKinnon, at his home. It's alleged he repeatedly fired a shotgun at the father of six, hitting him again and again on the body. 41-year-old Finlay MacDonald's also alleged to have attempted to murder Faye and John Mackenzie at their home in the village of Dorney, nearby on the mainland, by repeatedly firing a shotgun at them. The jury was shown photos forensic officers recorded at the three homes. There were two bullet holes in a window, a gun on the floor, cartridges inside and out, blood stains on a wall and door handle, damage to a ceiling. Finley MacDonald denies the charges. He's lodged a special defence that his ability was impaired by abnormality of mind. The trial continues. Maureen Kinnebrat reporting Scotland at the High Court in Edinburgh. There was a time when the mention of rack concrete would only have interested building specialists. Now, if you were to hear it's been found in your home, it would open up a world of stress and pain. It's thought more than 2,500 properties across Scotland contain the material which is prone to collapse. And today, some of those homeowners went to the Scottish Parliament to, ma to demand more help. Joanne McCauley reports. Just like a tree, they're standing by the waterside. We shall not be moved. There's anger and worry amongst these homeowners since rack was discovered in their properties. Among them are people from Tillicoutry, whose homes were evacuated more than a year ago. Lindsay McQuater hasn't been able to get back in since to get her belongings, and she's paying a mortgage on a home she can't live in. 13 months down the line, and I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't cry. Um, I mean, as I say, it was my home for 23 years, and um, it's, just, it's just caused a big massive gap and heartache and you're dealing with everything else, you're dealing with insurance companies not paying out, still having to pay your mortgage, um, and it's, it's, it's just financially and mentally massive impact on people's lives. Stop the rack! Homeowners like Lindsay are demanding help from the Scottish Government to deal with the issue. They want a national fund to pay for their homes to be repaired or replaced. Rosalind and Ronnie Bell are still living in their house in Livingston, but are very worried about the future. Help us get a house for a house, because that's basically what we need. We do, we've, we've paid mortgage-free for years. We, we were mortgage-free when we bought the house in Craig's Hill. And uh, to lose all that money, it would it, be devastating if they just offered you peanuts for your house. In the morning, you're like looking and I'll say to Ronnie, do you think that's darkness coming through? Do you think that's a crack? Uh, you're just watching. You're watching all the time in case something happens. The campaign group handed in its list of demands to the Petitions Committee at the Scottish Parliament today. The committee has agreed to take the issues forward and gather evidence. And the Scottish Government says it's already taking steps to try to help the rack victims. I think we've spoken to the UK government, the previous UK government had said it would try and find, fund what was ever necessary at the time to remediate at RAC. So that was continued to the new UK government. So we've spoken to them about that. I've got a meeting coming up with my equivalent, not just on this issue, in the next few weeks. So we'll raise that with them. We've written to them, but I think still to hear on that particular issue. The Scottish work together. Meanwhile, the campaigners are planning more protests as they continue their fight for more support and a public inquiry. Joanne McCauley reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. To some of the day's other stories now. And the family of a woman who died after being struck by part of a lorry have told a fatal accident inquiry of their heartbreak and horror over her death. 26-year-old Chloe Morrison was walking with her mum on a pavement near Drumnadrocket when she was hit by a steel beam of the vehicle's extended stabiliser leg in October 2019. Lorry driver, 53-year-old John McDonnell from Inverurie, was later sentenced to 100 hours of unpaid work and banned from driving for 12 months. 
More than 100 post offices could close across the UK, including nine in Scotland. Branches in Kirkwall, Stornoway, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Inverness are all under threat, under plans to streamline the business. All 115 branches are directly owned by the post office, which says they could stay open in private ownership. CalMac has announced details of how it plans to deploy its vessels over the winter. It says there's a chance Monday sailings to the Isle of Colonsay in the Inner Hebrides will be cancelled in February and the route to South Uist faces possible disruption for two weeks in March. The latest problems have come about because one of its largest ferries, the Caledonian Isles, is still out of service for repairs after almost a year. And Scotland's concluding Nations League matches against Croatia and Poland will again be broadcast on YouTube rather than on TV. Scandinavian broadcaster Viaplay owns the rights to show the games, but announced in June last year that it's scaling back its operations in the UK. The company will still produce coverage of the matches, but they'll be shown on the Scottish FA's YouTube channel dedicated to the national side. Now, more sitting SNP MPs have applied to stand as candidates at the next Holyrood election. Stephen Flynn, the party's Westminster leader, announced yesterday that he wanted to run to be an MSP in 2026 and that he planned to stay on as an MP and serve in both parliaments at the same time. And it appears other colleagues are considering the same. Well, our political correspondent David Wallace-Lockhart is here with me. Um, what have you been hearing today then? So, Laura, we know Stephen Flynn wants to run for Holyrood and if he's elected, there he wants to stay on as an MP as well but only take one salary something that's known as having a dual mandate. Today his SNP colleague Stephen Gethins has spoken to the Courier newspaper and he's confirmed that he's applied to be vetted as a potential candidate. No decision on whether he'll run and Dave Dugan is another who confirmed today that he's made the same move. Now remember the SNP only have nine MPs at Westminster so this is three of them at least considering trying to get into Holyrood. The the awkward thing for the SNP here is they spent years criticising Douglas Ross when he was leader of the Scottish Conservatives for being both an MP and a, an MSP. They said he was trying to have his cake and eat it, that he couldn't possibly represent constituents effectively at two parliaments. Now, today we have Dave Dugan suddenly defending that exact idea. It is possible to do that if you are essentially representing the bulk of those two constituents being your constituents in both um, parliaments. I think that's reasonable to do. It's actually no more or less than the UK Parliament asks English MPs to do uh, to represent their constituents' interests on matters health, transport, environment, education. That's the, that's the workload that English MPs have to deal with. Now, we should say not everyone in the SNP agrees with Dave Dugan. We've heard from the MSP George Adam today, former Scottish Government Minister, and he was saying he thinks having a dual mandate is wrong. We asked John Swinney about this today, and he said that the party's yet to decide what its rules will be on this for the 2026 Holyrood election. Mm. And Mr Swinney has also been talking about another potential candidate, Michael Matheson, the former Health Secretary. Yeah, Michael Matheson, who of course re resigned over that scandal about his iPad bill. The Times newspaper has reported that he submitted himself for vetting uh, for 2026. In other words, that he might be considering standing again. We've not independently confirmed this, but we have contacted Michael Matheson to ask and haven't heard back. John Swinney today said that Michael Matheson had previously made a mistake when he was in that role as health secretary and he'd taken his punishment for that and it was now time to let him get on with his life. OK, David, thank you. Well, same with politics and MSPs are calling on the UK government to reverse its decision to impose inheritance tax on farms. Hollywood's political parties united against Labour to criticise the move, with both the SNP and Scottish Conservatives saying it threatens the sustainability of farming in Scotland. The UK Treasury says it has taken a fair and balanced approach and around 500 farms across the UK will be impacted each year. A Grangemouth boss says there have been no credible bids to buy the refinery, which is due to close next year with the loss of 400 jobs. Ian Hardy from Petroineos Manufacturing told MSPs on Holyrood's Economy Committee that the refinery lost £385,000 every day last week. He said he was hopeful that new opportunities would come about of, out of Project Willow, a feasibility study into the potential of low-carbon manufacturing. But he said it wasn't viable as an oil refinery. At no time in the last five, <coughs> five years of the current state of the discussions around Grangemouth 
writ large, or in the last 18 months when we've really drilled down in discussions with ministers and officials, has there been a package of financial intervention support offered to the shareholders with a view continuing refinery operations? Scottish Government and UK Government have conducted their due diligence. They have drawn the same conclusions that we have drawn, that it is not commercially viable to continue operations. The question Tonight's main news again. Investigators see the deaths of two men killed when a tugboat capsized on the Clyde were caused by a breakdown in safety procedures. George Taft and Ian Catterson both drowned when their vessel went down near Greenock last February. Still to come in the sport, we hear from the man leading Falkirk's resurgence with the championship side eyeing a return to the top flight. Now, wildfires are, according to the fire service, one of the biggest threats now to rural communities in Scotland. So they're spending £1.6 million to find better ways of tackling the problem. Among the new kit being used, leaf blowers and jet washers, as our environment correspondent Kevin Keane has been finding out. Fighting fire with wind. Blowing air at the flames might seem a mad move given oxygen fuels fire, but using leaf blowers is a surprisingly effective tactic that's being deployed more and more. We've got leaf blowers, we've got drip torches, and then the main piece here is the actual fogging unit itself. In fact, there are a range of tools being loaded onto all-terrain vehicles like this to help tackle one of rural Scotland's biggest threats, as both the fire service and landowners make themselves better prepared. We're going to have longer fire seasons, we're going to have more intense fires and more severe fires. And in the Scottish context, it's the severe fires, which could be peat fires, that we are most concerned about, because they're the ones which absorb huge amounts of resources. What they're not investing in, though, are helicopters. They're a common sight now, particularly on some of the larger fires. They're paid for by landowners' insurance policies and could be deployed for days or weeks. And there's concern that some firms are reducing the cover available. You'll be flying for maybe five or six hours and the fire is not, nothing's happening. Uh, all you can do is to carry on and wait for cooler, cooler weather at night to maybe stop it from spreading as quick. Uh, but Sometimes it can be, you're just putting out in the same spot and it's not going out, it's not going out. The fire service is reviewing its rural provision with the aim of improving response times to wildfires. Fast interaction is, is key for stopping a wildfire getting large. Um, so some of the equipment that we will have, the all-terrain vehicles, the, the smaller um, double cab pickups that can get to the scene much earlier and down tracks for that early intervention is critical. Firefighting experts from as far as Australia and Canada are in Scotland this week for a global wildfire conference. All agree that the threat is growing and we need to be prepared. Kevin Keane reporting Scotland. OK, let's get tonight's sport now with Lewis and Champions League football at Celtic Park again. Absolutely, Laura. Yes, European football is coming thick mm. and fast. It's over at the women's game this week. Yes, Thanks so. very much. Cheers. Hello there. Yes, it is a big night for Celtic women who are playing a Champions League game at Celtic Park for the first time. And they're up against Chelsea, one of the top sides in the competition. Amy Canavan is there for us. Good evening from Celtic Park, where women's Champions League football is staged for the first time this evening. And my goodness, it's a cracker as the champions of Scotland Celtic welcome the champions of England Chelsea. Now, as you would expect, mixed fortune so far for the sides in Group B. Sonia Bonpastor's WSL winners have two wins from two. Elena Sidiku's SWPL champions have suffered back-to-back -back defeats in their maiden group stage campaign. The Swede, though, has been enthused by the progress made by the side, though she did say in her press conference yesterday that there is no bigger test than taking on Chelsea tonight. This is a Chelsea team, of course, who have Erin Cuthbert, the Scotland international, in their ranks. She makes a return to Glasgow. She left as a self-confessed young and naive 18-year-old girl and returns as one of the leaders of the London club. You can listen along to find out how Cuthbert and co get on in action on BBC Radio Scotland. Extra kickoff from Celtic Park is at 8 o'clock. Amy Canavan, reporting Scotland, Celtic Park. 
Now, while the Premiership takes a break during the international week, men's domestic football will be focused on the Championship this weekend with Falkirk manager John McGlynn hoping that his league leaders can take a giant stride towards the top flight with a win away to second-placed Livingston. It's been quite the story at the Falkirk Stadium after a decade or so in the doldrums. This was them winning the League One title last year. They did it with barely a hiccup along the way, going undefeated, and they're having a big impact in the Championship. Here they are at the top with a healthy six-point lead. Victory on Saturday would stretch that lead to nine points, which would make them clear favourites to secure back-to-back -back promotions up to the top flight. Paul Barnes has been speaking to the man leading their title challenge. John, a fantastic start to the season for you. How pleased are you with the way things are going? Oh, delighted, absolutely delighted. We didn't expect to be uh, six points clear at this stage. We didn't expect to be at the top of the table at this stage. We're very, very much ahead of uh, schedule. Uh, you're kind of thinking coming up, and I mean, it's a long way to go. You're kind of thinking maybe a playoff place, and it might well be that that's where it ends. But uh, we're certainly in a very good position right now. Good guys, all done. Good luck. What do you think you can really achieve here at Falkirk? We felt if we could get it going, the clubs here has a club the size of the club, the fan base, everything about it, history, everything was like, yeah, it's a club that you could, if you get it going the right way, you can just take off and you could go promotion, promotion. And again, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but yeah, you've got to have that belief that you could do that. And we're in a great position right now. On Saturday, we've got an opportunity to make it nine. There'll be a long way to go, regardless if we win, lose or draw, there'll be a long way to go. And uh, we're very happy where we are, we're very comfortable with the players that we've got and the squad that we've got and we're doing so well that I don't think we'll be disappearing anywhere soon anyway. Into the box he comes, gets the shot, oh for he's squirmed past the keeper this time! And Calvin Miller doubles Falkirk's advantage, Hamilton nil, Falkirk 2. Do you think this squad of players that you've got at the moment would be able to compete in the Premiership? I think technically, the way we play, I think we could step into it, but we will need to recruit. You know, we'll probably be fighting at the bottom and scrapping at the bottom of the table, probably for different reasons. But if we could get there, I think your guys would have cut themselves very well. You've still got a great enthusiasm for the game and vast experience. Where do you hope that your management career will still be able to take you? Been mentioned for for jobs recently, which is nice that pundits see the work that you're getting done and they're kind of promoting you for for jobs. But I'm also happy here, and I brought all these players here and re-signed the ones that were were here, and there's not too many of them left. So I'm really, really content with the, the way that we're, we're, the direction that we're going. One step at a time, I think, you know, I'm quite happy. If we could get there, that would be like, you know, amazing. We'd be, be, can you go and take the club after a season or two into the top six? Can you see a four stand across there? Can you see European football? You know, it's a way down the line, yeah, but I think you've got a dream as well. Scottish Rugby has posted a loss of £11.3 million, despite generating a record turnover of almost £74 million, helped by revenue from Taylor Swift concerts at Murrayfield. The loss was partly attributed to having no autumn tests and just two home Six Nations games last year. Meanwhile, Edinburgh flanker Luke Crosby is hoping to re-establish himself in Scotland's back row after enduring some untimely injuries, as well as competition for places in Gregor Townsend's squad growing. But Crosby feels in a good place as the Scots prepare to face Portugal on Saturday. Ah, it's a roller coaster, like, like one minute you're starting against Wales and the next minute you're having to get your missus to help put your socks on. So, But nah, it's, that's part of the sport. And then all of a sudden one knock and then that's your whole mindset, thought process leading up to Six Nations completely changes. But that said, I've came back better from that. And now I'm just really focused on just getting back out there, playing with a fist on my, on my chest and enjoying what I do. And what a night it was for Lowland League leaders East Kilbride, who stunned championship side Air United to book a place in the SPFL Trust Trophy semi-finals. Scott Brown's side had recovered from two goals down to level, but Cammy Elliott grabbed this winner for the fifth tier side. It's another cup upset pulled off by EK boss Mick Kennedy, who you may remember guided Darvel to a Scottish Cup win over Aberdeen. So racking up some memorable Absolutely. nights there with Kennedy's <laughs> team. And they will play either Rangers B or Queen's Park in the final run. Yeah, you wouldn't beat a uh, bit against East Cobb, right? Certainly you? Wouldn't. In anything Certainly for that wouldn't. matter. Okay. That's for sure. Thanks, Lewis. OK, over on the BBC Scotland channel at nine o'clock, Laura McKeever speaks to two runners whose lives were saved by the same defibrillator just weeks apart. They are calling for more to be registered across Scotland.
So it was, it was amazing to meet Stephen and just someone that had gone through the same experience, but not only that, in the same place, using the same defibrillator to save our lives. So just incredibly grateful. And you can see more on that story over on The Nine tonight. OK, let's take a look at the weather now with Christopher. Now, that's beautiful. Isn't it just? Yeah, yeah, there's been some really lovely weather in Murray in recent days, but there is change on the horizon, mm. turning much colder. Hats, scarves, gloves. Of course there is. We'll Thanks, need Christopher. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Good evening to you. Uh, for many parts of the country, it's been dry today. In the northeast, though, bright sunshine lifted temperatures to 15 degrees across Aberdeenshire. This time next week, closer to four. How do we get there? Let's take a look. Through the course of this evening and overnight, many areas dry, uh, but much of the west and northwest will be cloudy with spots of light rain or drizzle. Where it's clear, a bit of mist and fog forming and temperatures in some towns and cities, three to five Celsius milder in the northwest. So to tomorrow, for most it's dry, for many it's cloudy, the best of any bright weather, any sunshine. Through the central lowlands in the southeast, elsewhere the cloud fairly thick with spots of rain or drizzle towards the west coast and the northwest. By mid-afternoon, if you get the sunshine, temperatures up to around 12 or 13 Celsius, not bad for the likes of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Perth and Dundee and perhaps in towards Aberdeen as well. Towards the west and northwest, it's cloudier, Spots of light rain or drizzle here across the West Highlands and in the far north of the Northern Isles, a moderate, occasionally fresh westerly wind. Tomorrow evening, some mist and fog forming once again, a lot of cloud around, a bit of mist and murk in places. And then for Friday, high pressure getting squeezed away, a cold front bringing rain to the northwest and strengthening winds too. So here's the picture on Friday, early sunshine across Tayside and the northeast, elsewhere cloudy. There's that weather front, ahead of it some patchy rain through Argyll and the West Highlands and then the wet weather turning heavy later on and with it some gale force gusts around the coast. Elsewhere a breezier day, still mild, but the weekend sees low pressure to our north and we'll start to see some showers or longer spells of rain. Those showers increasingly wintry over the hills and high ground because we start to change the wind direction to a north cold wind and that will deliver some arctic air across all parts for next week. Here it is in terms of numbers. Take a look at that. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at best four, five degrees. Bit of sunshine, a few showers in the north will be wintry too. That's the forecast for now. Thank you, Christopher. Nice, nice main news again. Investigators say the deaths of two men killed when a tugboat capsized on the Clyde were caused by a breakdown in safety procedures. George Taft and Ian Catterson both drowned when their vessel went down near Greenock last February. And a woman has told a murder trial she was stabbed repeatedly by her husband in front of their children at their home in Skye. Finlay MacDonald denies murdering his brother-in-law and attempting to murder his wife and another couple. And that is reporting Scotland for now. Anne McAlpine will be here with your late news at half past ten tonight. In the meantime, from everyone on the team, enjoy your evening. Good night.